Today, the lecture will deal on aldol reactions and cycloadditions. We are about half a lecture behind the original schedule, which will lead to this that we will do quite a bit today uh, on the PowerPoint uh, rather than that I will draw all the structures. All the PowerPoints you will see today, again, are in the net. Uh, you can download the handouts, but we need to catch a little bit up because I believe Professor Matt McIntosh is already on the plane uh, heading his way from Fayetteville, Arkansas towards us. He will arrive tomorrow morning and he will uh, give the lectures next Friday and next Tuesday and the following Tuesday. We talked about enolates and one of the very important reaction processes which we will look at today is the reaction of enolates with carbonyl compounds known as the aldol reaction. So we have understood that an enolate is a nucleophile that you can react it with electrophiles and carbonyl compounds of course are good electrophiles as well which leads to such beta hydroxy carbonyl compounds known as the aldol reaction and that is probably this way as you have learned about this reaction in the second semester in the basic organic chemistry class. However, we will do this now a little bit more in detail because this reaction is, uh, has this feature of these beta hydroxycarbon compounds being structural elements in natural products in biologically active compound and it is important to be able to control stereochemistry. And in an aldol reaction, you can form two new stereocenters here. And there are some very good rules uh, which will show you how to control the stereochemistry in a relative but also in an absolute way. <coughs> Now again, this is a reaction which goes through a six-member transition state because the enolate you generally will create will have a methyl, metal atom associated with, the, with this. And if the methyl atom is coordinating the aldehyde the, and the enolate oxygen, the reaction goes Again, as we have seen so many reactions so far through a six-member transition state, reorganization of six electrons in the transition state, uh, again, an aromatic transition state, is a favorable arrangement. And therefore, these type of reactions work quite well. And this is the general process. Let's have a look at the general reaction. There's some terminology to be aware of. The three different types of aldol compounds you can form are either aldol compounds where the two new stereocenters are formed in the way that the hydroxyl group and the methyl group are on the same side. If you draw then the skeleton in the zigzag formation, which is called the synaldol. If they are on different sides, it's called the anti-aldol. And this will arise from the reaction of an aldehyde and a substituted acetaldehyde. In this case, I've drawn here a methyl group. And indeed, this arrangement where you have alternating hydroxyl and methyl groups is the one which are mostly found in natural products. If you just have 
the reaction of an aldehyde with a methyl ketone here, where you only create one zero center on this position, but do not create uh, a, a zero center on this uh, position. This is called the acetate aldol pro product, simply because it is derived from an acyl uh, or from an acetic acid derivative here. So again, as we have seen already in the simple alkylation of uh, enolates, the same is true for the uh, aldol reaction, that the geometry of the enolate you will form is decisive about the outcome of the aldol product. And again, it's been differentiated if you have a Z enolate, meaning the enolate oxygen is on the same side as the substituent, or if you have an E enolate, meaning the uh, enolate oxygen is on opposite side to the substituent being attached to your carbonyl compound. And the rule, as we will see in just a second, is that if you have a Z enolate, you will form a synaldol. If you have an E enolate, you will form an antialdol. And as we have also seen on previous occasions, Reactions which go through a six-member transition state, having saturated centers inside, are very well described by a chair-type transition state, and that is again true for the aldol reaction as well. So here is what is known as the Zimmermann-Trexler model describing this, and what you have to do is you arrange the enolate and your aldehyde in a chair type transition state where the metal atom is coordinating both the enolate oxygen and the carbonyl oxygen. And so then if you do this, you arrange it, the one thing you have to take care of is that once you have decided, and we have learned already that some control factors uh, for Z or E enolate formation, once the geometry of the enolate is decided, you have to draw it correctly into the transition state as well. So look at this here. We have the oxygen uh, of the enolate here being in the Z-type geometry with this methyl group, and it's opposite to the hydrogen here. So the enolate geometry is reflected correctly here. Let me maybe turn down the lights a little. Very dark, right? Let me do it this way. Now with the aldehyde, again, you have a choice. You arrange the aldehyde, and you have the choice of putting one substituent in an equatorial position or one substituent in the axial position. And since large substituents prefer the equatorial position, uh, the R group of the aldehyde equatorial is preferred and the hydrogen goes axial. You know where that is. One, three interaction, uh, diaxial interaction has to be minimized. And if you now connect the bonds in this type of transition state, you should see that you are forming the syn diastereomer. And again, for the tutorial and also for yourself at home, I would highly recommend that you make yourself clear that if you do now this bond connection, indeed, if you then rearrange the atoms here, that indeed both of these uh, new stereocenters are formed uh, in the way as it is depicted here. Now note, of course, that there are two syn diastereomers here. There are two enantiomers here. Both of these hydroxyl groups could go back, as shown here, or both of them could be in front, which would lead to the enantiomer. And the enantiomer, and again, something we should do for the tutorial, would be uh, obtained if this aldehyde would be drawn to the back and the enolate would be drawn to the front here, if I simply mirror my six-member transition state. This leads to the enantiomer, and there is in the absence of any chiral information, both of these transition states, aldehyde in front or aldehyde to the back here, are equal. And, all, and naturally, 
you would form the two enantiomers in a one-to-one -one fashion. And we will see in a moment that if you introduce chirality in this position, that then you can differentiate between the two uh, chair type transition states, and that then you might only form one of the enantiomers preferentially. If you go through the E enolate, the only thing with it which is different here is that now this methyl group is placed anti to, these, to the oxygen enolate here, as seen here, correctly reflected now here in the transition state. And this will cause in a flip in this stereocenter, which is reflected now on this position, giving you the anti-diastereomer. So again, you should at home try to convince yourself that these type of transition states indeed lead to the uh, diastereomers shown here. Now, if you introduce now chirality in a way which we have seen for simple uh, enolate alkylation already, using the oxazolidinones as a chiral auxiliary, out of the two possible, in this case now diastereomers, because we have in introducing chirality here, so the aldol products you are forming now. Uh, the two different ones, having hydroxyl and methyl in front or having hydroxyl and methyl in the back, are now diastereomers because the chiral center here is fixed. And uh, only after we cleave the auxiliary, we will then come to the enantiomers. And now we have already discussed that if you form an enolate from a carboxyl amide, you will inevitably form the Z enolate in order to avoid the 1,3 uh, strain between the substituent here, if it would be pointing down in the enolate geometry, and this center. However, now you are having a chiral, chiral information here. So the two transition states, and basically both are drawn here, having this chiral auxiliary attached once with the aldehyde in front, once with the aldehyde to the back leading to the two different synaldol products are not equivalent any longer because we have chiral information here. Now something very interesting conceptually is happening. Depending again on the, on the way you form the enolate with which kind of a metal atom, you can control with the same type of auxiliary. You see the stereocenter in both cases is the same you can actually control to form either syn aldo uh, diastereomer. Now, in the so-called boron aldo, you will take this compound here, dibutyl boron triflate, which has the feature And the triflate being the trifluorosulfonyl acetate here, uh, the anion. This compound has the feature that the alkyl groups, if you coordinate it with carbonyl or oxygen atoms, the alkyl groups will not exchange. Only this group here can be displaced by the aldehyde or the metal enolate. And what this is doing is that now if you do the aldol reaction, look that in principle you have three carbonyl uh, atoms where you would like to coordinate with your Lewis acid. You have the oxazolidinone which we have seen last time, which can chelate a metal here. And then you have your aldehyde oxygen, which uh, in the transition state is chelated uh, together with the enolate in order to form that six-member transition state. Now, in your boron-Lewis acid you're using here, you do not have two open coordination sites. Because these two are blocked, these groups will not leave the alkyl groups. 
The only group which we leave is the uh, trifluorosulfonyl group. And this means that chelation with this oxygen of this auxiliary here will not take place. The boron has only two open coordination sites, and it will coordinate the aldehyde. It will coordinate the enolate, but it will not coordinate the carbonyl. And so now if you draw the six-member transition state, first in the way we have done this in just, uh, just seconds ago, now you have to introduce your chiral auxiliary as well. And now the rule is again that since this oxygen is not coordinated, the mo molecule would like to minimize its dipole. You see that the oxygens are pointing here in this direction. And in order to minimize the dipole, this carbonyl will point away from these oxygens. And if you do this this way, you draw in the auxiliary, then you can see how this is done here. If you reflect that zero center correctly, this is pointing to the back now. And you can see that it's pointing away from the chair. If I would have switched aldehyde and enolate, as it is shown here, then this auxiliary would have come to the front. But if it would be oriented in this way, as it is shown here, the isopropyl group pointing to the back would then mean that the isopropyl group would tower on top of the, on top of the chair. And therefore, this arrangement where the isopropyl group is behind the chair is better than if you had, would have the chiral auxiliary in front, switching these two, then the isopropyl group would come uh, uh, on top of the chair. And so again, if you do this, and then if you draw the compound out, now out of the two possible syn aldol adducts, you are only forming this one, as shown here. If you take a different Lewis acid, if you take a titanium, if you create a titanium enolate, which is usually created that you first form the lithium enolate with LDA, and then subsequently take a titanium four species, titanium tetrachloride. Very often people use titanium alkoxides, uh, like, and all of them are known with one chlorine, two chlorines, three chlorines, all the different uh, chloro species with alcohols are known here. Then the titanium is able to coordinate, in principle, has six open coordination sites. So now the titanium can coordinate both the carbonyl group from the enolate, the carbonyl group from your oxazolidinone, and it can also coordinate the carbonyl group from your aldehyde. And now what will happen is if you put this in the chair type transition state, and now you can see it's switched. I have switched the the aldehyde is now in the back. The enolate is now in the front. But because the auxiliary is also coordinated to the Lewis acid here, you see that this whole thing is turned around 180 degrees. And now this arrangement is more favorable because, again, the isopropyl group is now showing in front, but is showing away from the chair. It's not towering over the chair like this small hydrogen is doing. But now you have switched enolate and, and aldehyde, which then will lead with very good selectivity to the synaldol, which is uh, to the synaldol product, which is shown here, which again is opposite in stereochemistry as the one shown here. So again, as we have seen already with the simple alkylation, taking the same chiral information in form of this oxazolidinone, putting it on an enolate, and then choosing the appropriate uh, enolization conditions, you can actually form either of the syn aldols. And again, keep in mind, the syn aldols are formed because the Z enolates from carboxyl amides are formed uh, selectively. If you then, after the aldol reaction, cleave the, uh, the auxiliary by hydrolysis, you will end up with the free aldol compounds, the compounds you want to 
Sometimes there's some concern that if you do hydrolysis that the nucleophile could attack on either of the carbonyl groups and it has been shown that the reaction is very selective if you use a very good nucleophile like lithium hydroperoxide in order to uh, arrive at the uh, cleavage of the oxazolidinone rather than breaking this bond here. There's a second very important variant of the aldol reaction and this is something we have related already seen also for additions of L silanes. And this is the so-called Mukayama aldol reaction. The Mukayama aldol reaction has solved one very important problem in the uh, Initially, we have learned that doing a mixed aldol reaction is difficult because if you form the, an enolate from one compound and then if you have a second carbonyl compound present which can also form an enolate, you would have the problem that uh, either enolate can be formed and that the enolate can react with the second carbonyl compound but it can also react with itself. And so making an aldol connection between two different carbonyl groups. So far, we have always said will work best if you if you are in a situation where you would have for example one carbonyl compound which you cannot enolize, and then where you have a second carbonyl compound which you can enolize, but now this enolate will preferentially react with the more reactive aldehyde carbonyl rather than that this enolate will react with itself here. And so this is how we initially learned and started to say this is a way uh, a cross aldol reaction can be successful. But if you would simply try to have two different carbonyl compounds, for example, then you would have run into problems of selective enolization and then subsequently also selective uh, reactions. Now the concept of the mukayama aldo reaction takes the following approach. <clears throat> what you do is rather than starting from a carbonyl compound and, and forming the enolate and then trying to react it with the second carbonyl compound, you will first form a silyl enol ether by simply deprotonating the carbonyl compound you would like to have react as an enolate deprotonating it with a strong base and then subsequently trap it with trimethylsilyl chloride. And so this way you will form a silyl enol ether which you can use as a enolate equivalent. And now if you react such silyl enol ethers at low temperature, if you react it with your aldehyde compound, in the presence, and there are two variants to this, in the presence of a Lewis acid or in the presence of fluoride, which will cleave the silyl enol ethers in both and, and make the enolate, which then will react with the aldehyde compounds, you will arrive again at the aldol compounds and you can use two different 
uh, two different carbonyl species here and make them react selectively. Now the uh, reaction mechanism is proposed that the Lewis acid, if you use this variant, will coordinate your carbonyl compound and then the sile enol ether will react as a nucleophile. Uh, it's reactive enough, uh, nucleophilic enough to react with activated carbonyl species to form the aldol compound. In principle, it has been, it could be also, would be also conceivable that the Lewis acid is cleaving the silyl enol ether, making a metal enolate, which will subsequently react, but it has been shown that this is actually not taking place, that the, Lewis, the role of the Lewis acid really is, uh, its role has uh, to activate the carbonyl compound rather than forming here the metal enolate. And if you now compare the transition states which are postulated with the L-silanes which we have added to uh, carbonyl compounds, you will see that it is exactly the same. There is no difference. There is again, it's proposed again that the mukayama aldo reaction in the same way like the L-silanes do not go through closed transition states, but that they rather go through open transition states. And now, rather than having an L silane as we had it before in the allylation, now we have the equivalent, we have an O silane group hanging off here instead of having a CH2 silane group uh, as we had in the L silane. So it's a complete analogous transition state. And what is postulated here again is that this attack should take place in the way that the silyl enol ether and the carbonyl take an anti position to each other. So this points anti to the carbonyl group. And then there are two uh, different repulsions you might want to avoid. And as been, it has been argued that if you have sterically bulky Lewis acids, which will coordinate to the aldehyde here in the way that this sterically bulky acid is away from the substituent which is on the aldehyde group here, that then the second interaction you need to avoid is the interaction of this group R with the Lewis acid here, which then will, uh, which then will define the way the silyl enol ether is here oriented towards the uh, with, with, the, with the aldehyde group here. And again, I would like to do this, uh, to look at these transition states a little bit more detail in the tutorial, but in the same way as it was argued with the L silanes, it is argued here now as well that both the uh, Z silyl enol ethers as well as the E silyl enol ethers will lead to the same aldol compound and they will preferentially lead to the anti aldol compound. So the mukayama aldol reaction in this variant very often gives you the anti aldols while the, uh, the, um, the Evans type uh, aldol reaction we have just seen with the oxazilidinone auxiliaries will give you the, the syn aldols. And this one thing we will not go further in detail, but if you make this Lewis acid chiral now, and there are many variants which are many examples which have shown this, by using a Lewis acid where you put chiral ligands on this, you will not only control the relative stereochemistry, but you will also control the absolute stereochemistry. Again, keep in mind there are two enantiomers here, two anti-enantiomers which can be formed here. Now the fluoride process, where you will take simply fluoride and cleave off the silyl enol ether, making use that the fluorosilicon bond is one of the strongest bonds known, again allows you to introduce such an aldol process. But interestingly enough, this process with the same reaction partners preferentially leads to the syn aldol. And again, 
open transition states are being proposed, carbonyl group anti-oriented to the silyl enol ether. But now there's one big difference. In the example before, we had the Lewis acid here. And then if this is sterically bulky, the Lewis acid tries to avoid uh, the groups uh, hanging on here. Let's look at this again here. Here we have the Lewis acid, and it tries to avoid this group, and it also coordinates anti to this group. So this makes that both of these groups are on the same side here because they are trying to avoid the Lewis acid. In the fluoride process, there is no Lewis acid here. So now the decisive interaction is that this group here and the R group of your aldehyde try to avoid each other, and they are placing themselves as shown here. And this leads then to the other diastereomer in the aldol compound. And again, you should make yourself clear by drawing it yourself that indeed such a transition state will lead to this syn aldol. And no matter if you start on the Z or on the E uh, enolate, in both cases, uh, you would end up with the same allyl product. Okay, so this was what I wanted to tell you on allyl chemistry. And as I say, we did this relatively fast. I realized that if you, in an exam, would have faced the problem to draw these structures in a, in, a, in a good way and then to deduce absolute and relative stereochemistry, in limited time you would have for such an exam, I'm aware that this is difficult. So don't be afraid that we are putting lots of these examples on the exam. On the other hand, I hope that if you see these pictures that you, you understand the rationale. And the one thing you should really try is you should then take these transition states and see if you can correctly lead them, bring them to the products which are shown, and, and basically understand the rationale which is behind uh, the proposal of these transition states. Now I would like to start with another reaction which goes through a six-member transition state, although it's not a chair-type transition state this time. And we will start now on cycloadditions, which will be part of the series on Woodward Hoffman rules, concerted reactions, uh, and Professor Matt McIntosh, who is an expert in sigma tropic rearrangements, will give you a lecture the next two times on 3-3 uh, three, three sigma tropic rearrangements and related processes. But in order that he can do this in a, in a good way, we need to talk a little bit on Woodward Hoffman rules and on simple deals either reaction, which again you have encountered before. Uh, as, a, as a preparation. Now, cycloadditions are a very, very powerful way to construct molecules and to construct, in a, in a very rapid way, complex um, structures. Nevertheless, it looks like that by, at least by and large, maybe entirely, there's still a lot of debate about this. Nature is not using cycloadditions. And you will see some examples where you almost wonder why that is, because you will see that dilts eiler reaction 4 plus 2 cycloadditions are so powerful to construct rapidly com complex structures that it is uh, amazing that that is a tool which is apparently not being used by nature. Let me introduce some gentlemen to you, which, again, I need to dim the lights even Even further, from a historical perspective. So does anybody know who this is? Looks already a little bit older. And you can see it's also an uh, old style picture. This is Otto Diels. He was a professor at the University of Kiel in the north of Germany. And even up today, if you go to Kiel, through Kiel, you will see 
Autodeals Straße, Autodeals Platz, everything. They named a lot of uh, a lot of things after him there because he was a very famous chemistry professor at this university, and he discovered, among other things, but he discovered uh, uh, the, what is known now as the Diels Alder reaction. This gentleman is Alder, Kurt Alder. He was a PhD student of Otto Diels, and that goes back to 1928 when they did more or less the first uh, concerted cycloaddition, 4 plus 2 cycloaddition. There have been some examples of that before, but they realized how that process uh, worked and how, uh, what kind of products were, have been being formed. Anyone knows who this is? This is R.B. Woodward. And R.B. Woodward was, together with uh, Hoffman here, was the one who laid out the edifice of what is now known as the Woodward-Hoffman rules to make uh, us understand these type of cycloaddition processes, because there were many aspects which, when these reactions were discovered, were so unnatural in the way one would think about bond constructions that only after the so-called Woodward-Hoffman rules were uh, established uh, that uh, one would understand these type of processes. Now this gentleman here is uh, Professor Fukui. He is the more or less founder of the frontier molecular orbital theory and he did a lot of calculations in order to explain the Woodward-Hoffman rules uh, on, a, on a theoretical basis. And so these five gentlemen basically contributed greatly to, the, uh, to what is known as the, uh, uh, to the cycloaddition type chemistry. So Diels and Alder got in 1950 the Nobel Prize for the discovery of the Diels-Alder reaction. Hoffmann and Fukui got the Nobel Prize in 1981 for the so-called Woodward-Hoffman rules, which described and explained how these type of processes are working. Does anyone know why R.B. Woodward was left out here? No Nobel Prize for him for the famous Woodward-Hoffman rules. No. It's given to three persons as a maximum. You're right, there's a limitation, so you, uh, not more than three people can get the Nobel Prize in a, in a certain area, but there would have been room. But unfortunately, Arby Woodward was not alive any longer in 1981. Uh, he died in 1974, and, and uh, 1979, I, I believe, and I, I should check this. Uh, and we need some editing then here on this. Um, but he was not alive in 1981 when the Nobel Prize was given for him. Now, fortunately, he received the Nobel Prize in 1965 already for his great contributions to, to synthesis. And so he certainly was not left out by the Nobel Prize Committee already, but he made so many great achievements that he could win one much earlier, and certainly if he would have been still alive, he would have won the Nobel Prize uh, for the explanation of, this, of the cycloaddition type reactions as well. So let's look at the general process. And this is one, of course, you know. In the simplest way, a diene and a dienophile will react to form a cyclohexene. So whenever you see a cyclohexene, type structure, you should always think about, can I make it by a Diels-Alder reaction? And the way it was explained that this can, would react in a very easy and facile way is that you had to do an orbital analysis. You would construct both on the diene and on the dienophile the, uh, the pi orbital, since the pi electrons are the ones which are uh, doing the reactions here, so you do not have to co uh, consider the sigma framework. All you have to consider is the pipe framework. 
And so if you do this on the diene, you create the pi orbitals, you start having uh, one, the lowest lying orbital having no node in here, having one node, and then the next one having two nodes. In the butadiene here, we have four pi electrons. So two electrons go in the low lying orbital here. Two electrons go in the next tying orbital here. And then this is the highest occupied orbital, which is called the HOMO. The next higher orbital here has no electrons. It's called the LUMO, which is depicted here. And then there's one even higher orbital uh, up here I have not shown, which has then uh, which has uh, three nodes, which again is not occupied here. So what you, what you need to identify is you need to identify the highest occupied orbital of your pi system and the lowest unoccupied orbital of your pi system. And the same thing is being done here on the, on the dienophile part. Now here, very simple, you have your pi bond which you can construct one molecular orbital which has no node in here and one orbital where the two faces are on opposite sides, so creating one node here. Two electrons in your pi system, so the HOMO is occupied. So this is the HOMO here being occupied and this is the LUMO here. And now the simple rule is that you are reacting your diene and your dienophile on the end of these, uh, of, of the, the atoms here. And now what you do is you analyze the interaction of HOMO and LUMO as usual, only an occupied and an unoccupied reaction uh, orbital will, uh, be, uh, will form a productive process. So you analyze if your highest occupied orbital and the lowest unoccupied orbital, if the faces are correct, by looking at the ends here, and so if you look at this here, this HOMO has on the end has opposite faces, and our LUMO over here at the ends has opposite faces. So therefore, when you overlap this, these two orbitals match. And the same is also true if you, if you interact this HOMO with the LUMO from the diene here. Now the HOMO has the same faces uh, on both sides here, and you can see that the LUMO also has the same faces on both sides. So if these are interacting here, again you're forming, uh, you have an attractive interaction. As a general rule, it is recognized that orbitals also interact best if they are closest in energy, and although you have two possibilities, the HOMO of the diene can interact with the LUMO of the dienophile, or the uh, HOMO of the dienophile can interact with the LUMO of the diene. Uh, nevertheless, uh, it, depending on the substituents you have here, two of these orbitals might be closer in energy. And the very often the situation you encounter is that you have an electron withdrawing substituent on the uh, dienophile and electron donating substituents on the diene. And we will see this in a moment electron donating, donating substituents raise the orbitals in energy, electron withdrawing substituents lower the electrons in energy, and this will uh, usually lead to the situation that uh, the HOMO of the diene will interact with the LUMO of the dienophile. We will see this in just a second a little bit more in detail. Here's again what I, what I just said. So if you have a given HOMO or LUMO orbital, if you attach electron acceptors to it, then you will lower the energy of your orbitals. Simply think about this if the uh, if electron withdrawing substituents are pulling electrons out of your on your attached orbitals, basically the orbitals will be uh, inclined to accept easier electrons and therefore being lower in energy, and opposite, if you have donors on your 
uh, on your orbitals, the energy in both cases, no matter if it is homo or lumo, will rise. Electrons are easier uh, ejected because of the donating neighboring substituents, meaning that the orbital energies are higher. The situation is a little bit different uh, in, in, in the case of conjugated substituents. It has been shown that if you have a conjugated substituent, let's say another double bond or a phenyl group on there, that you will raise the homo energy, but you will lower uh, the lumo energy uh, as well. So the picture here is a little bit different than in the case of donors or acceptors. If you, if you do a Diels-Alder reaction, there are two different types of products which can arise out of this. First of all, the reaction is stereospecific. The overlap between these new bonds here in, a, in, the, in this defined way will make sure that whatever groups you have here on your diene and on your dienophil will have the same stereochemistry in the product. So if these two X groups are on the same side, they will be also on the same side in your product. Same thing here. If these two Ys, they are on the outside, they go on the same side, and the inlying hydrogens in this case are uh, also on, on the same side of the product. So that's something which means the reaction is stereospecific in the way that it will reflect, the products will reflect the starting geometry of diene and dienophile. However, in the transition state, there are two ways the dienophile can approach the diene. And you can see if this is here as drawn the diene, then the dienophile can approach either pointing the X groups away from the diene, which is the so-called exotransition state, which will then result that the X groups and the Y groups are in the product on different sides of your, of uh, uh, different sides, in this case on the six membered ring plane. However, the groups can also approach going on top of the diene here. And this way then, all these four groups will be on the same side. And this is the so-called endo product because the groups are all being oriented on one phase now of your cyclohexene. Now for steric reasons, you would immediately say, well, the exotransition state, the exo product should be favored, right? Because if X is bigger than the hydrogens here, then it would make sense that for steric reasons, the X groups pointing away from the diene rather than uh, being close to the diene here. However, very often, and this is still, even today, one of the rules which are not very well understood, but very often you observe products uh, which arise from the endotransition state. One argument which has been put forward is that it has been seen that especially you get endo products if you have X groups which, which themselves contain carbonyl systems. For example, carbonyl groups. If you have uh, fumarate or malate, uh, where you have ester groups or aldehyde groups here. And it has been argued that there is a secondary interaction of the pi systems being present in your X groups and the newly formed double bond here in your diene. Right? So the pi systems, has been argued, are attracted. Do not, they, they do not repulse each other, but uh, there's an attractive interaction which then leads to the sterically more encumbered, but because of that attractive interaction, more favorable interaction. Now, here's an example for this, and this shows you that up to today, nevertheless, with this rule, the endoselectivity is not really sufficiently explained. And there have been calculations which actually show that this argument of this so-called secondary over orbital 
interaction is probably not very valid. At least it's not really reflected by theoretical calculations. So very difficult, and I cannot, and I do not want to get into great detail here, and I cannot even give you uh, a, a good argument other than this N rule which is put forward, but uh, as I say, it is highly questioned on theoretical grounds. Now look at this here. L let's look at some, some real examples to, to g get us an idea how well this N rule is followed or not. You do the reaction between cyclopentadiene and acrolyne. And again here, you have the, the, the possibility that this group here is interacting with the pi system, leading to the endo product, or it can be the exo product here uh, pointing away from the pi system. And so if you do this reaction with acrolyne, carbonyl group could do the secondary overall interaction, you see an endo exo selectivity of 100 to 0. You will form exclusively the endo product. So great, the rule is okay, right? So for this example, the rule holds very nicely. Now if you go to the acrylic ester, you still see preference for the endo product, but only about three to one. Now that probably still is not of big concern, right? Because you would say, well, the aldehyde group is smaller, the ester group is bigger, so, so probably I still have the electronic preference here, but there's a steric component now which will make the exotransition transition state based on steric reasons more favorable. And what I see here is the reflection of this. I see here that uh, therefore I have still some electronic control, but steric control kicks in, which then leads to a three to one exo selectivity. Okay, so we're probably still okay with this. Cyanide. Now we all would argue that cyanide is, is a very, very small substituent, right? So that short steric interaction should be not existent, more or less, with this, at least much lower than with this. And now you see already what is happening here. 60 40, so the selectivity even goes more down. You probably could still hold this somehow by saying, well, maybe then the pi interaction of a cyanide is not as good as that as of a carbonyl. So probably you'll still be reasonable, okay? Now look at this, L-bromide. The pi system more or less is missing here. You would also think that it is a pretty big substituent. So if anything should arise, then steric interaction should be more severe here, and you see it forms exclusively the endo product. So there, there is still room for understanding here. As a general rule, you can you can remember that indeed, more or less, endo products are formed with high preferences, especially if you have pi substituents in there. And uh, this is the, one of the arguments always put forward, but I think as you can see here, this argument also has some flaws. Another thing which was uh, recognized is that the Lewis acids, if you apply them, enhance endo selectivity. And that probably can, can be understood in that the Lewis acid is interacting with the carbonyl groups of your dienophile, and therefore the electronic components, the uh, pi interactions of the pi system of the diene interacting with the pi system of the carbonyl group, donor acceptor substitu uh, uh, interactions, is certainly enhanced if a Lewis acid is, is taking out electrons from one pi system, then the other pi system becomes better, or the donor character becomes better, and therefore this interaction is better. Now let's look at some other regioselectivity issues. And uh, there are some very straightforward, and there are some which are not so obvious, but fortunately there's a very simple rule. And this rule is that the regioselectivity, if you have monosubstituted dienes and dienophiles, usually follows, in, in almost all cases, the so-called autopara rule, meaning that if you have a choice by connecting these uh, two molecules, you will form the auto product, connecting the atoms as it is shown here, rather than connecting this atom with this atom, so flipping the diene, 
dienified by 180 degrees. So, rather, so you connect these two atoms and these two atoms, and you're not doing it the other way around. Now, in most of the cases, this can be understood by simple polarization arguments here. If you look here at your dienophile, because you have an electron withdrawing substituent here, this conjugated system position here should be the electrophilic position. And you know this. Accolades add to nucleophiles, uh, and a nu so the nucleophile will attack here. So you know this is the electrophilic position. Now, in this electron-rich diene here, we have an enamine. And again, you know that the enamine, you have a, the donor here. You know that the enamine is nucleophilic on this position here. So it's, and then by uh, conjugation, this will transfer to this position here. So this is the, the nucleophilic position. This is the electrophilic position. And so indeed, it makes sense that nucleophile and electrophile uh, carbons are being connected here. And this is indeed what you observe. Now, it has shown that this type of argument, although it gives you the right result, is probably not the best argument to put forward. And a more detailed one came through the calculations uh, where people showed that in the HOMO and in the LUMOS, the orbital co coefficient have different sizes. And without going into detail how to calculate this, and I believe you all have, or some of you have theoretical chemistry uh, with Professor Schutz, and the programs you can apply there can calculate you HOMO and LUMO, and not only energies, but they can also show you then in this HOMO and LUMO where the most electron density on which carbon is located. And you will see then that these coefficients have different sizes. And the rule is that usually, or not usually always, coefficients of similar sizes will overlap. So the, the atoms with the, where the large coefficients on the diene and dienophile are, will be uh, overlapping, and, and, and the small coefficients will be overlapping. And if you do this analysis, you would find that uh, in such a situation, this carbon here has a larger coefficient than uh, the other carbons here. And the same is true here for this acceptor substituted uh, diene. And so therefore, this is the favorable arrangement. But again, you might say, works pretty well with the polarization argument here as well. And for this case, it is true. It's also true for, it's also true for in this situation. Now again, I have an acceptor substituted dienophile, I have a donor substituted uh, diene. Again, you see here the enol ether, so you should immediately recognize that this carbon here is the nucleophilic center. This carbon is the electrophilic center. So from simple uh, polarization arguments, it makes sense that these two centers are overlapping. And indeed, this is the product you observe. Again, it's the para. If you think about this from the aromatic nomenclature, it's again the para product which is being formed rather than the meta product. And again, it has been shown that if you do the orbital coefficient analysis, that again, the big orbital coefficients of HOMO and LUMO are overlapping here. Now, what I was always puzzling is that there were exceptions to this rule when it comes to the uh, to the polarization arguments here. If you have these two carboxylic acids doing the Diels-Alder reaction here, you still ob observe the so-called also product here with good selectivity. You see it's not exclusive any longer. If you do, however, now the polarization analysis, you will see that you are now connecting the two electrophilic carbons with each other. And that was always very difficult to understand if you just go by what, where's the nucleophilic part, where's the electrophilic part in, uh, in the system. And therefore, uh, it was argued that the simple uh, polarization argument model is not really explaining all the cases. And again, if you do the orbital coefficient analysis, you also see that in this case, 
the large orbital coefficient in the HOMO uh, is located, uh, between HOMO and LUMO is located in this way. And this will give you, <coughs> this will give you or explain the uh, set observed selectivity here. And the only case you have to remember to, uh, that this auto power rule will not hold in the product distribution you get is if you have a donor on the diene and a donor on the dienophile. In this case, you also observe meta products to a large extent. And there it was shown that the orbital coefficients somehow become very similar on both of these atoms and therefore being uh, forming both of the products more or less in similar amounts. Let's think about a moment again what is Lewis acid catalysis doing for the diels alder reaction. If you do the simple reaction between butadiene and an alkene here, you have a homo-lumo uh, interaction. And actually, homo and lumo are so far energe energetically apart from each other that the uh, diels alder reaction will not take place. If you attach an electron acceptor to your diene, what you do is, to your dienophile, what you do is you lower both LUMO and HOMO. So these energies go down, both on the LUMO and on the HOMO side. And what is happening now is that the energies between the HOMO of your diene and the LUMO of your dienophile become closer, and therefore the reaction proceeds more easily. Now, if you attach now, if you coordinate your, uh, your dienophile with the Lewis acid, you even further decrease the electron density. You basically make your electron accepting carbonyl group even stronger by pulling out electron density through the Lewis acid. And this will lead to the situation that, again, the LUMO and the HOMO is further lowered, and HOMO and LUMO energy become even closer to each other, and therefore uh, the diels alder reaction will proceed even faster. Now, very interestingly, and not too long ago recognized, is that if you have a situation where you have the carbonyl group being coordinated to, the coordinated to a loose acid, that this is actually the isoelectronic case of having an imenium cation here. So think about this, that if you make from the carbonyl group here from acroline, you make the imenium cation by reacting the carbonyl uh, compound with the secondary amine. Very well known process. Shift base formation, we have all learned. So if we go from acroline react this with a secondary amine, you will form you will form this aluminium cation. And this is isoelectronic. to the situation where a Lewis acid is coordinating to your carbonyl compound. And so interestingly, it was recognized during the last years that also secondary amines can actually catalyze and accelerate greatly diels alder reactions. And you see what, if, it, if this should be really a catalyst, you see what you would like to have is you would like to have this somehow being reversible. The Zyder reaction takes place here, let's say, with a diene
And then if you can find reaction conditions where this is all in an equilibrium, where this is then hydrolyzed again, you regenerate your amine, which can form, act as a, as a true catalyst and can react again uh, with your carbonyl compound forming this amine. And this will react in the Diels alder reaction much faster than your starting acrolyne here. So we will not go much more into detail. There is a special lecture on these type of organic molecules which can catalyze uh, reactions. Organocatalysis is known for, we have a lecture in the, in the seventh semester, so for you in the, in the next year if you are interested in this. But it has been very important to recognize that Lewis acid, but on the other hand also bases, an amine typical base, nevertheless can activate a diels alder reaction and other processes by this type of by this type of process. Okay, let's look at some practical examples. All we did was theory so far. Now, the first paper on the diels alder reaction came out in 1928 by Diels and Alder in the German journal Liebig's Annalen, very traditional, uh, one of the oldest organic journals in the world. Uh, it's now uh, part of that journal, European Journal of Organic Chemistry. Um, and this publication appeared, and interestingly enough, as it was apparently used uh, as, as was apparently done in these times, you can see what Diels and Alder wrote uh, in, uh, in that publication. We explicitly reserve for ourselves the application of the reaction developed by us, meaning to everybody else, hands off, right? Now, even up to today, you can fill many books and books and books. There are even today coming out so many applications and uh, conceptual new processes on the diels alder reaction that a lifetime of hundreds of chemists has not been enough to really explore the potential of this type of reaction. And in fact, interestingly enough, Diels and Alder got sidetracked by other exciting discoveries they did, and they haven't done really too much additional work on this type of reaction uh, they had discovered here. One of the uh, first applications to natural products has been uh, in this very small uh, natural product called uh, cantharidine. And you can, I guess, immediately see how you would probably connect this by a diels alder reaction. You should recognize there's the six-membered ring. As we said, whenever you see a six-membered ring, you should Ask yourself, can I do it by a diels alder reaction? You should then keep in mind that a diels alder reaction is producing a cyclohexene. So you should put somewhere into your six-membered ring a double bond if you want to do a diels alder disconnection. And so one of the uh, possibilities would have been here. But the other possibility, and that's probably not so obvious, was to actually form not this compound by the diels alder reaction, but actually form this six-membered ring by the diels alder reaction, by the second diels alder reaction, to do a diels alder reaction between these two molecules, form this six-membered ring here, and then afterwards form the, uh, the anhydride here by cleaving the double bond uh, and reorganization of the bonds. And this compound here, I'm not sure if I have it still here. You should see now that this can be done Let me just draw it here by another Diels-Alder reaction.
if you react furane and an acetylene, keep in mind you can not only do the Zyder reactions with alkenes as dienophiles, you can also use alkynes and in many cases they are much more reactive than the alkenes. You will form the Dilsalda adduct here and apparently the starting material which we have just seen here is lacking this double bond here which can be achieved by a hydrogenation making use out of the fact that this is the more electron rich double bond. You have a problem, a potential problem that you could hydrogenate both of the double bonds here. It's the more electron rich, the less sterically hindered double bond and therefore hydrogenation of one double bond in this case is not a problem. And so by doing two Diels-Alda reactions, doing the Diels-Alda reaction between furane and this alkyne, you can make this compound. Doing a second Diels-Alda reaction between butadiene and now this double bond leads to this cyclohexene ring here. And then I believe what has been done here is uh, an ozonolysis or maybe also per iodide cleavage of this double bond to the uh, dicarbonyl compound and oxidation to give the anhydride here. Now another very uh, landmark synthesis has been the synthesis of morphine. Morphine of course already especially for this time here in the 50s had a quite a complex, uh, complex structure and of course as you all know it's a biologically very active drug and it's a medicinally uh, important uh, compound and therefore people have always been interested in synthesizing this. Now you will see in the handouts a great number of examples, probably more than we can cover here. There's no use of memorizing them. There's no use of, of uh, repeating the exact reactions. But I cho I've chosen these examples to underline some, con some concepts. And I hope that if you see these type of reactions that you can understand, uh, that you, you will understand the, the concepts behind this. And so here in this case, of, there was a Diels-Alder reaction carried out of this two chloro butadiene and this uh, dienophile here with this double bond being, substitute, uh, being uh, substituted by an electron withdrawing group here uh, was, is the dienophile. And what you can see here again the auto power rule uh, holds well here. The Zyder reaction takes place between this center and this center, and again, if you do the polarity analysis, again, it's, uh, it comes out the, it, uh, the, to the con correct conclusion as well. So this chlorine atom is oriented in the para position towards this substituent here, which is now drawn in its enol form. And so this explains that uh, this review isomer is formed rather than the meta isomer, which also would have been possible here. Now you see the yields were not very good. Long reaction times, 4.5, four and a half days, relatively high reaction temperature. The question is why is this? Uh, probably two arguments to this. The one thing is that it's a sterically relatively hindered uh, double bond here and so it is, it is probably difficult accessible. 
But clearly what you would do today if you would rerun this reaction is you would use the Lewis acid to accelerate it, right? At this point it was not recognized that Lewis acid will accelerate these type of reactions. And so I, I believe if you would apply a Lewis acid here, and that maybe is something we should try in the advanced lab once to make morphine, I would be pretty sure that this reaction will go a lot better if you would apply some kind of a Lewis acid, and you see this would be ideally suited. If you could do a, uh, use a chelating Lewis acid here, like titanium tetrachloride or uh, aluminum uh, trichloride. To, to accelerate this type of reaction. Let me uh, skip a few uh, examples. Let me point out that there are some dienes which are very useful in a, in a very general sense. One of the most useful uh, dienes is this one, the so-called Daniszewski diene. You see it is a butadiene which has two electron donating groups here. So it's an ex extremely electron rich diene which will allow you to, to do the Zeiler reactions with dienophiles at very mild conditions. Very often this type of dienes, these electron rich dienes will react at temperatures as low as minus 78 degrees. And since this is important, let's briefly look where this is coming from. And if this is a very complicated molecule to synthesize, and if you look at this, it's a beta carbonyl compound. And uh, these type of compounds are very easily and very readily accessible. And all you have to do is you have to enolize, you have to make the twofold enolate out of this compound. And then you can protect it either in the same way. So there are also the symmetrical uh, dienophytes known, or you can also protect it in a, in a different way. So it's very easily accessible. And what this does is, if you react it with an alkene, you will You will very rapidly make the cyclohexa, so the cyclohexa hexene gilts all as you would expect here. However, if you work this up, if you cleave the cyl enol ether here, You enolate, you enol will create the carbonyl compound here. And under the acidic conditions, methanol is lost very easily. And so therefore, after elimination,
you will have formed a cyclohexenone here. And so the Danishevsky diene is not only allowing you to very effectively set up Diels-Alder reactions, but within the Diels-Alder reaction, you form not in this case just a cyclohexene, you form a cyclohexenone, which is, of course, a very useful functionality for further synthesis. And therefore, uh, you can, uh, you will create useful functionality into your products as well. So as I said, it's, it's This diene is called after its inventor, Professor Samuel Danishevsky. He is a professor in, uh, at Columbia University and at the same time at Sloan Catering uh, Cancer Institute. Uh, so he has two positions, uh, two professorships at the same time. He is above 75 now, still extremely active, and is uh, one of the world leaders in natural product synthesis and synthesis of biologically active compounds. There are some other notable dienes which I have in your, uh, which, which are in the handouts. Uh, let me just point out maybe one more. Usually, if you would like to make a Diels-Alder reaction with butadiene, not such a good idea because it's a gas, difficult to handle. You can use surrogates like the adduct of sulfur dioxide, which in a Diels-Alder reaction, if you re react butadiene and sulfur dioxide, will form this Diels-Alder product. This is reversible. If you heat it, it will extrude sulfur dioxide and recreate, regenerate butadiene. And so uh, you can use such compounds as a crystalline uh, solid material as butadiene equivalents. Also quite interesting are compounds of this type. You see what this compound is if you take xylene and do a bromination uh, on each of the methyl groups here, you create this dibromo compound. And if this dibromo compound is losing bromine, And there are quite a number of ways to do this. For example, you can react it with zinc metal. Eliminating zinc bromide this way. And One of the ways to draw this now is in this diuretical form, which is a mesomeric structure. Of this compound here. And you can see it now this is a diene, but if this will undergo the Elsider reactions, it will regenerate the aromatic system here. And so therefore, this is an extremely reactive and versatile uh, diene you can use, very easily synthesized by, from such aromatic systems. From autoxylene by doing a photobromination. So again, very useful. And I believe I will have some examples here in the handouts to, uh, to look at this. Same is also true for some dienophiles. Uh, there are equivalents for the carbonyl group here if you take this alpha chloroacryl nitrile. 
I believe I have a, if you do, if you let this run in a Diels-Alder reaction, after you do the Diels-Alder reaction, forming the chloronitro group here, if you treat this with, uh, if you treat this with uh, hydroxide, you form the cyanohydrin, which will readily eliminate cyanide and forming back the carbonyl group. So this is a surrogate if you want to do a Diels-Alder uh, of a ketene. Acetylenes are very often substituted by sulfonyl groups because you can remove sulfonyl groups easily. And so if you use such vinyl sulfones, you can do Diels-Alder reactions with the equivalent of ethylene or acetylene. And we will, but then probably, as I said, not next week, and not, not this Friday and not next week, we will continue on this and look at some more examples. Uh, I will stop here. Uh, so if you, if you want to have a look, please, at the handouts already, they're in the net. But we will stop at this time here with the Diels-Alder reaction cycle additions, move on next Friday to sigmatropic rearrangements, and then come back to the cycle additions. Okay, thanks very much. And I hope to see you on Friday. Please take this chance. Native American, great speaker, great lecturer. I know that Thursday is a holiday. It will be a nice day. Do something nice, but please be here on Friday for the lecture.